أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وأعز المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المنتجبين واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين من رب العالمين In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful All praise be to him, everlasting and omniscient he is We begin in his name and we send our peace and blessings upon Muhammad And his holy household and our everlasting damnation upon the enemies of Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad Amina Rabbal Alameen My dear brothers and sisters I begin with the greeting of Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Peace and blessings be upon you As we continue our journey during the nights of Shahar Ramadan al-Mubarak The blessed month of Shahar Ramadan In our third episode in this series As we are discussing insha'Allah the prophetic sermon that was delivered at the end of the month of Sha'ban marking the beginning of Ramadan and marking the merits and the fada'il of Ramadan in the previous episode we ended on a note and inshallah we will continue in the previous episode we mentioned a lesson that we can learn which is the immortal message behind uh, the immortal message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi and his household Peace and blessings be upon them. And we made points. We said how this khutbah is studied year after year. And how the magnificence of this khutbah never ceases to amaze the listeners and the readers. And we said the same way the Qur'an never ceases to amaze the listeners and the readers. At it almost periodically, no matter how much we read the Qur'an. No matter how much we read the ahadith, there are lessons for us to be learned. And we said this is an important note for us in our communities to take heed of this matter. That in the bigger picture and the external picture, our communities have neglected the Qur'an and the Hadith. And then in the picture within ourselves, if we wish to call it that, we have neglected the practice of writing and reading and comprehension and pondering when it comes to the Qur'an and when it comes to the Sunnah. And we stated near the end as well, we gave some, some tips and tricks on how we should approach Shahar Ramadan by taking a notebook, writing verses of the Qur'an and taking in commentary of the Holy Qur'an and the reasons behind the revelation of certain verses or merely opening a book of hadith and taking from the Sunnah lessons. And we said, for example, one can begin with Kitab al-Kafi as an example. And read the narrations in the first chapter concerning the intellect, you know, and, and the intellect, sorry, the first chapter which deals with intellect and ignorance and so on and so forth. Before we begin, because we said there's two lessons that we wish to talk about or wish to, uh, to mention before we dive into the khutbah itself. So the second lesson we did not mention yet, and we will mention today, inshallah. But back to the first lesson, there are some instances that I wish to narrate to you guys, of course, and uh, that I did not, that I was not able to to narrate. And I did say, for example, I wanted to prove some of this and uh, prove the fact that the traditions that we have, this Torah that we have, the heritage that we have of Al Muhammad alayhum salam, whether it may be the books of Usul the books of Manaqib, the books of law, the books of history, whatever it may be. We mentioned that these these books were not handed to us with a bouquet of flowers and a box of chocolates. The This literature was passed on to us through blood. And blood was sought for and blood was was seeped because of this literature and because there are people who are the companions of the Imams and the Prophets for example and after that the just in general those who lived even during the times like since the last 200 to 400 years you'll find that the Shia and the scholars of the Shia the protectors of this grand uh, grand faith 
Shia faith, the Shia creed, have been dealt atrocities and have been dealt crimes beyond our beyond what you can imagine. You know, and of course we know the Imams of course faced all of this as well. It is for a fact that the Imams faced all of this. It's the reason behind their death. The reason behind their death and their martyrdom which because was because they did not stay silent in face of the tyrants and the oppressors. And they spoke the truth even though it dealt to the sword or to the poisoning of their sacred self. As an example, right, just to show you how grand these crimes that were committed by the so-called leaders of Islam. When we say Khulafa, we generally mean the Khulafa, however you may count them from the first Khulafa, from the predecessors all the way until today. Khulafa, Khulafa, I'm using it in a general sense. Whereas Al Khulafa, Al Asliyin, Wal Khulafa, Al Rashidin, Wal Khulafa, Al Mahdiyin, Al Hadin. The true caliphs, the true rightly guided caliphs who are guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who they themselves are guides are of course the 12 imams from Ali Muhammad starting with Ali ibn Abi Talib and ending with Al-Mahdi Al-Muntadhar Ajalallahu ta'ala Farajahu Al-Sharif. These are the true caliphs when I say khulafa the true khulafa but of course when i mean al khulafa you know dawlat al khulafa the, the the governments of banu al abbas the governments of bani umayyah then you'll see truly the crimes that were committed the crimes that were committed against who against the writers and the transcribers of history and of those of those individuals were shia it is it's almost agreed upon you can almost say that some one some or if not the first you know, according to what Sayyid Murtada uh, in, in as Sahih Min Sirat Al Nabi, Sayyid Ja'far Murtada Amili, Hafidhullah Wa Ra'a, reports the narrations that say that Abdullah ibn Abi Rafi', the son of Abu Rafi', who was a Mawla, a servant of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, whom Rasulullah freed and a very close companion of Rasulullah, the family of Abu Rafi' were very close to the fam to, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and to Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam. These are individuals from the Sahaba that we do not focus on unfortunately. Individuals that are held in high magnitude. Individuals that are held in high regard. Who are the protectors of the Sunnah. Right? Ubaidullah ibn Abi Rafi' the son of Abu Rafi' as an example. I'm saying this as an example. I just want to show you I just want to bring that claim. You know, when I said that we were dealt as uh, crimes, there is crimes committed against the Shia literature. Let me show you. Not just against Shia literature, my dear brothers and sisters. Crimes were committed against knowledge because those who are in power chose, wished to choose what they wanted the people to hear. We'll see how Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, and uh, I believe it was him, we'll see, the, we'll read the narration exactly. But he would tell, for example, uh, Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik when he went to Hajj and read the hadith in full, inshallah, when, when they wanted to, to write the history of Rasulullah, the seerah of Rasulullah, the biography of Rasulullah, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is maghazi, his conquests and the wars that happened during that time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, uh, during his lifetime, you will find that anything that has in it a disregard for Bani Umayyah and shows for example the Ansar or shows those who are who shows anything basically that shows the truth and high regard was disregarded which is an issue and we'll read the hadith in detail but going back to Abdullah Ubaidullah ibn Abi Rafi' so like I said in the Sahih Min Siratun Nabi Sayyid Ja'far Murtada Al-Amili Hafidhullah Wa Ra'a reports the following he reports the following um and he says, and he mentions all the sources, by the way. I'm, I'm quoting directly from his book. He says, a consensus from the sources can be established that the pers first person to write seerah, seerah to nabi meaning the biography of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, 
and and or the history of Rasulullah or the, usually when we say Sirat al Nabi, all the events that unfolded around the Prophet and the history of Islam in general, because Rasulullah is Islam. The first person to write the Sirah was Ubaidullah ibn Abi Rafi, a servant of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And he was a Coptic, because Abu Rafi was a Coptic, he was a Qupti. And then again he says, he says, and in the Dari'ah ala Tasanif al Shia, Agha Burzug al Tahrani rahmatullahi alayhi reports, and he says, and he was the first Muslim to write in the Maghazi and the Seer. He was the first person to write books in, about the Maghazi and the Seer of Rasulullah. Meaning what? The conquest and the biography and the autobiography and the biography and the history of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi. So that just shows you that 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 somebody like Abu Rafi had had that knowledge of Rasulullah's history and his conquest. And somebody like Ibn Abbas would come to him and seek knowledge of this. Now, going back to this hadith that I wanted to narrate to you, uh, found in the book uh, Zubair ibn Bakkar. Zubair ibn Bakkar was a historian and he is a descendant of Zubair ibn al-Awam. And he is a scholar, a, a Sunni Mukhalif scholar, who was also Thiqa. Ad Dara Qutni says he is Thiqa, and he lived in the time of Banu Abbas. So basically, he was a scholar of the Sultan, as we say. He was a scholar of the the empire at the time of Banu Abbas. He has a book called Al Muwafiqat. Al Muwafiqat, on page 222, he reports the following incident. He said, Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik came to Medina for Hajj on the year 82 after Hijra. He ordered Abban ibn Uthman to write the seerah of the Prophet and his conquests. Abban said to him, I have transcribed it and I have authenticated it from someone whom I trust, from somebody who I trust. Sulaiman then ordered 10 kutab, 10 individuals who know how to transcribe and copy books. 10 writers to copy it and then they copied it on a parchment when he received it he began to read it see this is this is this is the part that's important he noticed in it that there was the accounts of the ansar and the accounts of the aqabatayn the two bay'ats the two pledges of allegiance in the aqaba and the accounts of badr so he started reading it then he said never have i stated that these people have merit Either my family held contempt towards them or they did, they did not have this merit. He was angry about it. He was angered. He was angered that there was this merit when it came to the Ansar and Allahu A'lam what else was in the books of history when he was reading it. Abban responded. He said, Ya Amir, O Commander, it does not hold us back. It does not hold us back what they did. We state the truth. They are as I described in this book of ours. This is the truth that I described in this book of ours, in this book that I have that has been passed down to me. Sulaiman then said, What use do I have for this book until I mention it to Amir al Mu'mineen? He says. And he might disprove of it. And of course, by Amir al Mu'mineen here, we mean Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. He said, He ordered it to be copied, so he copied it. And then he burnt it. Okay, now we don't know why he burnt it yet, but watch. The hadith will, will show, will tell us why he burnt it. <clears throat> then he returned and informed his father, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, about the book. And his father was furious. He said to him, What is the use of you presenting a book that has no merit in it in for us? It will inform the people of Sham of matters that we wish them not to know. Suleiman then said, and it is for this reason that I ordered that this, the books that were copied to be burnt. So this is Abdul Malik ibn Marwan's tariqah. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan's principle is that if it has fada'il of Banu Umayyah, then it is kept. If it does not have fada'il of Banu Umayyah and it has the fada'il of others, because he said, he clearly says, he says, and read it in the وَمَا حَاجَتُكَ أَن تُقَدِّمْ بِكِتَابٍ لَيْسَ لَنَا فِيهِ فَضْلٌ تُعْرَفُ أَهْلُ الشَّامْ أُمُورًا لَا نُرِيدُ أَنْ يَعْرَفُوهَا What's the point of having a book 
a book that the people of Sham, the residents of Sham, will then know stuff about us that we do not wish them to know. Because my dear brothers and sisters, ignorance, ignorance is our greatest enemy. So you see, the books that had the tariq and the history and the seerah were burnt. You know, and this is just one example. This is just one example. You would have to go and look at the followers of the Ahlul of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhum salam and the books of Rajal, and we see the likes of of Jabir ibn Yazid al Jufi, for example, and his and the way he was he was uh, he had to run away from the Sulta and the companions of the Imams, for example, and the books that they had and the books that were burnt and the books that were lost. My dear brothers and sisters, this Sunnah. The Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and the Quran and the ta'wil of the Quran, the tafsir of the Quran, this literature that we have, this heritage that we have, my dear brothers and sisters, it is not to be taken for granted. It is not to be swept aside. You see, for example, the crime. This is one example that I wish uh, that I wanted to bring. Go back to the books of Sirah, go back to the books of Rijal, go back to the books of history, go back to the books of the autobiographies, the books of Rijal and the books of history. Go back to this, go back to Tariq and Sirah and so on and so forth, go back. And you will witness this yourself, you will witness the crimes that were committed. You will see the ittihad but Ashab al-A'imma alayhum as -salam. The austerity and the pain that they faced, the affliction that they faced, and yet still they stood with their heads up high and they delivered this literature through blood, through blood and through their lives. Many lives were lost. Many lives were lost. So my dear brothers and sisters, and I think we're running very short, we're running very close again to to the end of our discussion, our third episode, and we haven't yet touched upon the second line of wisdom that we ought to take from the khutbah yet. SubhanAllah, look, we haven't even began speaking about the khutbah. But then you'll see, just from the hadith itself, before even beginning the hadith, there are so many lessons to take. Now imagine, we haven't even begun, because that's why I even feel that I won't be able to even go through the entire sermon by the end of the series and this series will only be expanding depending on my capability inshallah 14 to 15 episodes inshallah if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me the, the, the power and courage I'll be able to do more inshallah for your benefit of course and for the benefit of all inshallah so my dear brothers and sisters on that note inshallah we wish to come close to the end of uh, this segment episode 2 segment or now we're at episode, episode three. Look, I'm even, I'm losing it. I think uh, it's getting to all of us, by the way, uh, being at home. But alhamdulillah, though, the, the, there is almost a blessing, you can say, being at home. Maybe this, this, this being at home will give us more time to, to focus on the Quran, inshallah. Will give us more time to focus on Al Muhammad, alayhum as salam. Will give us more time to focus on the A'mal. That will come up, inshallah. Many a'mal, many sacred a'mal that sometimes we are not able to do. And now, for example, for those either that are working from home or those who are now laid off from work, for example, inshallah, you all be able to be bestowed upon by Allah's sustenance and grace. But as an example, I used to take uh, an hour from my time to just drive to work and come back. And and I've I feel that I've saved an hour every day. If you take that into the take the whole week into account, that's five hours. In in one month, I've saved an entire day, days worth of time. And it's important that we do not let this time go to waste. And the message behind the last two episodes: do not neglect the Quran and do not neglect the Sunnah. They are both weighty, and they both hold weight, and they both hold magnitude. You need to read the Qur'an with the Sunnah. You need to take lessons from both in order that you succeed in life, inshallah. My dear brothers and sisters, the Ahadith of Al-Muhammad tell us 
that for you to be loved by Allah the hadith here says اعمل بفرائض الله تكن أتقى الناس the hadith is from Rasulullah peace be upon him and his family Rasulullah says and execute the obligations of Allah and you will be from among the most pious الناس, the one who has the most taqwa and taqwa my dear brothers and sisters is one of those levels that we all wish to attain taqwa is one of the levels of iman taqwa is one of the levels that you re- through taqwa you attain more iman and more yaqeen and you rise and rise and rise taqwa in Allah doesn't necessarily mean fear of Allah taqwa is pious and devout and sincere worship of Allah out of love and once you begin to love the Creator and once you begin to execute the obligations laid out by the Creator from the fast from the prayer that means that even you yourself not just your spirit but yourself your everyday actions change because this is all reflected in your ikhlaq and that is also another important matter ikhlaq is very important an abid has ikhlaq and one who has ikhlaq as well has ibadah they work hand in hand my dear brothers and sisters focus and do not neglect the Quran and the Sunnah in our next episode inshallah we will speak about the sanctity of time because we also learn from this khutbah a lesson and that lesson is the, the importance of choosing the appropriate time and the importance of time itself so stay tuned inshallah as we discuss this in the next episode which we are right now episode 4 correct no sorry now we're 3 we're going to go to episode 4 inshallah and I ask you for forgiveness once more and I ask you that you pray for everybody out there and inshallah as well if you can you pray for my parents and my beloved deceased grandmother and grandfather and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all during these sacred nights of Ramadan. And I say, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.